there we go. So imagine an infinite sequence of sentences, S1, S2, and so on, each to the effect that every uh, subsequent sentence isn't true. More precisely, in this way. S1 claims that for all k greater than 1, S of k isn't true. S, S2 claims the same, but now we replace here the 1 by a 2, and so on and so forth. First of all, it is not hard to see that this in fact leads to a contradiction, uh, because if S1 was to be true, then all the, the rest of the sentences need to be false. But for instance, for instance, focusing on S2, if S2 is false, it means that there is uh, some um, k greater than 2, such that S of k is true. But we get a contradiction because that, uh, that uh, hypothetical sentence would also be greater than 1. And here we have a contradiction. And F1, if S1 was to be false, then uh, one could guarantee the existence of a sentence ahead, and then one could repeat the argument. So here it is not hard to see that this is a paradox in the sense that none of these SM could be true nor false without provoking a contradiction. But this talk is not essentially on the, the paradoxical nature of the sentences, it is rather on the self-referential side of them. And Iablo's concern, Iablo's initial concern with this paradox is that, according to his understanding, it does not involve self-reference. In a previous presentation of this paradox, Iablo avoided the, um, the dots. And by dots, I simply mean these dots. What, because here one could suspect that both the paradoxical nature and some kind of not uh, having self-reference could be attributed to the dots. But in fact, one can avoid the dots. Here, um, T can stand, for instance, for uh, a new um, relation symbol that we had for uh, the theory of arithmetic representing truth. Um, and uh, using the diagonalization lemma, one can construct these sentences phi of m, or one can do the same with provability and uh, in fact, achieve, one can achieve uh, the first incompleteness result in this way, and it is rather amusing to do so. So this to say that with the previous construction can be formalized, for instance, in arithmetic. But the use of this phi in this more uh, arithmetical framework, or yes, I would like to ask a question about your first slide. Yes, one second. So the one with the paradox, presumably I'm the only one who hasn't seen it before. So you mean the, 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 the sentence S1 is the sentence that SK is untrue for all K greater than one? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Feel free. Welcome. And the use of the, the phi in this more arithmetical framework, or the S in the, the, the first uh, formulation that I've showed you, should still give rise to concern in what self-reference is, um, is needed. Because in this formulation from 93, we can still characterize this SN using this, let us say, schema, where SN is equivalent to for all k greater than n, not s of k. And this summarizes all the previous infinite list of sentences. And throughout my talk, I will mention uh, this uh, formula as being Y. And even without the dots, these equivalences require some kind of a meta function, um, S of something, where this dot is marking each argument. So in a sense, one could attribute the self-referential self -referential nature to this meta entity that I'm calling some kind of a function S of something. Or even uh, better expressed in lambda notation, lambda X, S of X. This higher type function is common to all sentences. And as I've mentioned, it could be regarding as some kind of a self-referential feature of higher type character. I'm going to formalize these ideas here in this talk in temporal logic, but one could do the same kind of um, move in modal logic. So for, temp for the temporal logic, in the end of my talk, I, will, I am going to show you that one can read 
uh, Iago Sperzok says being the sentence, I will remain false from the next moment on. And in the similar approach in model logic as being, I'll be false in the next world. But let us construct step by step this approach. And for that, I'm going to uh, express the Abus paradox in an order theory. The theory is rather simple. So it is a first order theory with a binary relation symbol that I'm going to call small and the following two axioms. The first one expresses the transitivity of this relation. If X is smaller than Y and Y smaller than X, then X smaller than Z. And the second axiom expresses a weak form of infinity in the sense that for all X, there is a Y uh, above the X. So there is a Y uh, greater than X. Clearly, this theory is consistent, by the way. And one very simple interpretation is to interpret this symbol as being the usual uh, smaller uh, relation in um, the natural numbers. So now let us consider the theory Y as being the theory T, but now I add a new relation symbol that I will denote by S and this axiom. And this is simply the formal counterpart of schema Y from my introduction because we have s of x is equivalent to for all k greater than x, not s of k. So we have a consistent theory t, we added an axiom, and in fact, this theory is inconsistent. So in that sense, we are expressing the paradox. And let us see the proof of this fact. Uh, I will consider several partial derivations and everything in the end will make sense. So please uh, stick to, to each derivation. So let us consider for each uh, term of y, the derivation d prime of t as being this one. And let us look more carefully to it. It has two open assumptions, s of t and x zero, zero greater than t. Uh, here on the left part, we apply the x in y, and we simply rewrite this s with the universal quantifier. But now observe that x zero greater than t satisfies this antecedent. And so we have not s of x zero. And again, we can apply uh, x and y to have the negation of this universally quantified formula, but this is simply this existential form. I believe this derivation is simple to follow. And now let us consider also the derivation d prime prime of t for a generic term t. It is this one. It has three open assumptions namely x1 greater than x0 and s of x1. It also has s of t and finally x0 greater than t. So let us read these, these derivations from the left to the right. Here uh, on the left part, we simply uh, consider the right side of this conjunction, here it is. Here we simply apply x in y and rewrite s using universal, this universal quantification. And here we apply the transitivity because x1 is greater than x0, x0 is greater than t, and so x1 is greater than t. And by the way, I'm using this symbol greater is simply the inverted smaller, okay? The rest is the same. Again, here we have the antecedent of this universal, uh, universally quantified formula. And so we conclude not s of x1, but here we arrive at the contradiction. Now, Putting all this stuff together, let us consider the derivation d of t. Now it is a closed derivation, as you will see, and let us analyze it from the left to the right again. Here we have the axiom of infinitudes or weak infinitudes, and I instantiate that axiom to the term t here, simply that. And here we have the uh, three assumptions from before. For, for the assumption s of t and x zero greater than t, I can apply the derivation d prime and conclude the existentially quantified formula. Here it is. And using these three assumptions, I can apply d prime, prime of t, namely this, this derivation and conclude a contradiction. And here it is. But now I can cancel this assumption that before was open with this universal quantification. And here I have the, the, the cancel and conclude the falsum. Here is the falsum. I can cancel again 
but now the assumption two with this universe with this existential quantification and i cancel again and now i simply have an open assumption namely one and i can put a contradiction so i can introduce negation and that's what i've done here so this is a closed derivation of not sft for a generic term t. so let us fix a term t0 we finally have this derivation so using the sorry using dft i can conclude not s of t0 i apply the axiom again to to instantiate by universal quantification and this is simply this existentially quantifiable now on this right side i apply the same uh, derivation but now but now for this other variable x of x of 3 i have this assumption and i can conclude s of x3 these two together give rise to a contradiction, but I can cancel this assumption, this open assumption with this existential quantification, and I get a closed derivation of a contradiction, and so the theory is in fact inconsistent. All this, this reasoning is simply a formal counterpart of the simple reasoning I was mentioning in the beginning. It seems to be really long because we are expressing it syntactically. But if you look carefully, you will see that all the features that were um, that appeared on the quick reasoning I made at the beginning also appear here. But this theory Y is not only suitable to represent Gabel's paradox because we started from a consistent theory and we start, we then uh, had an inconsistent one, but it is also minimal in the following sense. If one removes one of the axioms of the theory Y, we start to have a consistent theory. In other words, theory Y minus the first axiom, the second or the third, are, um, gives rise to a consistent theory. We prove this simply by showing the model. The first one is rather simple to, to give the model, simply the, the usual model for uh, the smaller relation. The second one needs uh, at least this kind of construction for the model and the last one needs to invert the interpretation but i i do not want to to enter in much detail here this is just to to show you the models and they are not really complex as you can see. okay but now let us move to temporal logic why because we have concluded that um this order relation is a suitable uh, way to analyze the atmosphere this entails that in fact the Abus paradox is not relying so deeply on arithmetic it is rather relying on the order relation and two simple properties about it namely the transitivity and um and uh, that weak form of infin infinity that i've mentioned so i'm going to continue with this other framework without directly mentioning arithmetic and temporal logic is a suitable logic, is a logic extending um, propositional classical logic by adding three operators, just like model logic does. And um, this is a suitable logic to talk model wise about um, order relation. Linear temporal logic is uh, one of such logic, but it's the suitable logic to, about, to talk about linear time, like, more precisely discrete linear time the time that is linked to um, the usual order on the natural numbers here i could have i could have presented a more general approach in the sense that i i consider i could have considered other temporal logics that are more directly linked to um to the to the the theory t and the theory y i've showed you but let us stick to linear temporal logic because it is much easier to understand and in fact, uh, it is much studied than other temporal logic. So LTL uh, is uh, a propositional uh, logic with three operators, X, G, and F, and they have the following meaning. X stands for, in the next moment, it will be the case that something, keep in mind that we are in the, uh, talking about discrete time. G stands for the future, it will always be the case that something, something and f talks about the future in dual terms of g in the sense that it states simply the existence of a moment it will at some time be the case that something 
Let us now define some structures for this logic. A, a temporal or cryptic, as you, you prefer, structure for the variables or the set of variables is simply an infinite sequence um, such that uh, each element of the sequence is a function that assigns variables to either zero or one. In this framework, for each k and i, one can define ki of phi, where this phi is an LTL form. And this, this is done by induction. The, the basis case is done for variables. For the ki of v is defined as being simply the image of at the i of v. The ki of the falsum is zero because the, this expresses the fact that the falsum cannot hold in any moment. Ki of an implication is one exactly when Ki of the antecedent is zero or Ki of the right side is one. Ki, uh, now the, the interesting part. Ki of the next moment phi or equivalent Ki of x of phi is simply Ki of Ki plus one of phi. And here we have the fact uh, directly expressed the fact that x talks about the next moment. Here we have the next moment. Ki of g of phi is when exactly when it holds for all j is greater than i that kj of phi is one. And here we have expressed the meaning of g and dually for f. Ki of f of phi is one exactly when there is a j greater than, than i such that kj of phi is one. And for the other logical connectives, ki of phi is defining, defining the usual propositional way. A formula is said to be valid in a temporal structure, and it is denoted in this way, if for, for every value i, ki of phi is one. And phi is called the consequence of a set S of formulas, and it is denoted in this way. If for every possible k, uh, this holds whenever this holds for every formula in F. And in, as usual, phi, phi is, called, is said to be valid, and it is denoted in this way, if it is a consequence of the empty set. 